Right now we have our uh, guest speaker coming up. Uh, we have Mr. Joe Barnes. Uh, he's an outreach manager for Compassion and Choices. It is an, uh, he's an experienced political organizer and was instrumental in organizing the effort to get the End of Life Option Act passed. So thank you for that. And uh, he now works with communities and volunteers across the state to provide comprehensive education about everyone's options for their last days or those of their loved ones. So let's give him a warm welcome and get him up here. Good morning. It's always a pleasure to be back in Los Angeles since I live in LA, but I spend so much time traveling around California just providing outreach and education to the general public. So when I get an opportunity to just be in Los Angeles and talk to people about uh, what we do and answer questions about all end of life care options that are now available in the state, it's a true pleasure uh, just to be off the road and just be here in Los Angeles. So uh, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking to you about what we do as Compassionate Choices. And uh, just bear with me as I get the pointer going. A lot of people might not be aware of it, Compassionate Choices, we've been around for about 30 years. Uh, we originated out of Santa Monica, California, and we progressed and became a national organization. And we fully support all end of life options such as hospice, palliative care. But we also know that the new standard practice of care that we learned a lot from in Oregon includes medical aid and dying. And it's a proven and trusted practice that allows individuals to decide on whether or not if, you know, if hospice not working for them or palliative care, they also have an expanded option of medical aid and dying. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. So we truly believe that in shared, shared decision making between you know, patients and doctors is so important and that's one of the things that we value the most at Compassion and Choices, just to make sure that the general public and healthcare providers know about all end of life options that are available. I love this quote and it's so beautiful. I don't know how many people have heard of a book called Being Mortal. Have anyone heard of that book? It's a great book and a fascinating quote that's in there from Dr. Gawande. And he actually says, life is meaningful because it's a story and in stories, endings matter. And that's so important. I always love to share with people my story about how did I get involved in Compassionate Choices. And I've been working for Compassionate Choices as a California Outreach Manager for about a little bit over two years now. And uh, this November coming up will be the two years since my dad passed away. And you know, my dad used to work in New York City at John Jay Criminal Justice College. And when he was retiring after 30 years, he went for his final physical. And during that process, he had his physical, and the doctors noticed his blood pressure was extremely low. And they started checking him out a little bit further. They said, something's wrong. We need to run some tests. And during that process of, they, you know, when they were running tests on my dad, they ended up finding out that my father had stage four colon cancer, and my father had a tumor in his side. And we were totally shocked because my father was a slim man. He was, I always joked and tell people, my father was like John Wayne meets Gary Cooper Shaft type of guy. <laughs> and, and that was kind of his model. And, and so when they actually gave my father that diagnosis, we were pretty devastated about hearing that news. So we started exploring all treatment options for my dad. My dad had chemo, my dad went through all the procedures. And during the course of his treatments, my father said to me, after he had his final surgery, after the cancer spread to his brain, and he had lesions and he had staples on his head from his surgery. And he said to me, he said, I never want to go back in the hospital again. It was such a horrible experience. I just want to die at home. And I said, Dad, you have nothing to worry about. You're okay. You're going you're gonna to be at home. You're not going to have to go back in the hospital. And he was showing me all the marks on his arm from the IVs and all the scars. And he kept stressing to me the importance of not wanting to go back in the hospital. And I spent two hours talking to my dad, and I said, you have nothing to worry about. You're not gonna go back in the hospital. You'll end up dying at home. And my dad always kept his emotions in check. We shook hands our whole life. We never said we loved each other. We just shook hands. And I leaned over to my dad before I left to come back to California, and I said, I just want you to know that I love you. And I gave him a hug, and he paused. And he leaned up and said, I love you too, and gave me a hug, and then right away we changed the subject and started talking about sports. And right at that process, my mom, who's a retired registered nurse, walked in the room and said, is everything okay? 
And I said, yeah, we'll just talk about the game. And I left, and I, you know, I said, okay, I'll talk to you guys when I get back to California, because I'm working on this campaign to pass medical aid and dying in the state. My dad said, do a good job. And that's what he always used to tell me. And I said, okay. And I got back home, and later on that evening, about actually about 2.30 in the morning, I got a phone call from my mom. And my mom told me that my dad wouldn't wake up when she went to give his medication, and she called 911. So immediately when my mom called 911, they started trying to resuscitate my dad. So my dad ended up in the hospital in an ICU. He ended up slipping into a light coma. And then from being in a light coma, he, had, uh, he actually had hemorrhaging in his brain. He had a stroke. So he went from being in a light coma into a deep coma. So now I'm on the phone talking to my father's physician. And he's telling me that if my father ever woke up again, he would be in a vegetative state. He wouldn't know who he is. And he would actually just be totally, you know, he wouldn't be able to make any decisions whatsoever about, about his day-to-day -day life. And I actually sat back and said, I cannot believe this. I just spent two hours talking to my dad about how he would never be in a hospital again. And I said, okay, so here's what I want to do, doc. I want to just go ahead and take my father out to the hospital and just let him die at home because this is what he wanted. And the doctor said to me, I'm so sorry. The only thing I can allow you to do is to move your dad from the ICU to the palliative care unit, and his body will eventually shut down. And I said, I, I got to tell you, this is not what my father wanted. I, I, all the paperwork my dad had, he explained that he didn't want to be on any machines. He just wanted to die at home. And so we're so sorry. This is how it works. If someone is in an ICU unit, if they're in a comatose state, the only thing family members are allowed to do is to move them from ICU to a palliative care unit. Now, if you want to go ahead and try other options, but I'm being very honest with you, if your father ever woke up again, he would be in a vegetative state. And I looked over to my mom, and I, I think I inherited this from my, uh, from my dad, whereas my dad wasn't a religious type of person. And I've never been much of a religious person, but my sister and my mom are very religious. And we actually sat back, and the doctor, we had such a wonderful doctor, and he said, what would your dad have wanted? And I said, the one thing my dad wanted is to go ahead and pass away. He would not want to be in this hospital. But when you're dealing with end-of-life care decisions, you always find half of your family is waiting for a miracle. And the other half is coming to terms of what's really going on. And I came to terms of what was happening, and it was my goal to get my father out of that hospital so he could actually be at peace. But what ended up happening is my father ended up staying in the palliative care unit for 13 days. And part of that 13-day process, his body shut down. I watched his body shaking. I watched tears coming from his eyes. And the doctor said, we just want you to be aware of he's not in any pain. And I said, I got to tell you something. I know my dad, he's in a lot of pain because this is not how he wanted to die. My father wanted to die with dignity and to have expanded options. And he never had that opportunity. And after we ended up, my father passed away after 13 days. We ended up giving him a lovely funeral. And I flew back to California, and the second day after I got back, I walked into a room to do a meeting to talk about passing medical aid and dying in California. And the first person asked me a question. They said, isn't this law going to abuse people? And I sat back just experiencing what happened to my dad, and it just became even so much more real for me. And I said, i got to be totally honest with you that when you experience a loved one's suffering and excruciating pain, and not having expanded options when you're dealing with end of life, it changes your perspective on so many levels. So I came back even more inspired to help pass this law. And that's why I work for Compassion and Choices after experiencing how my dad had a horrible death. And I always try to tell people that about my father is that I don't know if my dad would have chose to have access to medical aid and dying. But the one thing I know about my dad is that he would have wanted to have an option to decide for itself versus having to die in a hospital. So I bring up that story because it's important because so many people think about they know how they want to die. Everyone kind of has that assumption about, well, I know I'm going to die. But there's so many people who die in situations that they never expected that they would be in. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about is about, you know, not just medical aid and dying, but also want to make sure you can walk away with understanding about all your expanded options that are available. Because having options are truly important. So by a show of hands, hmm, I love this part. How many people have had a good life up until this point? 
by a show of hands. Oh, wow. That's good to see. Okay, this, this question is going to be a little bit tougher. And I just want you to think a little bit about this. Um, by a show of hands, how many people in a room are going to die eventually? <laughs> That's always a tough one. I always get a couple of people who don't raise their hands. <laughs> That's pretty tough. And I, oh, yeah. And think a little bit more about the next question that I'm going to pose to you. What would you consider as a peaceful death? Anyone want to tell me? What are you? Dying in your sleep. Yeah. Well, fascinating enough was what we learned from the American uh, Journal of American Society and Aging. They actually talked about most people wanted to have the option to die at home, surrounded by loved ones. Uh, people wanted to, if they had a spiritual need to their life, they wanted to have their spiritual needs met or their values respected. That was one of the options. Uh, people wanted to make sure they weren't a devastating burden to their loved ones. And these are all important factors that came out, were part of the study that was done. Jennifer Glass was one of our strong advocates who actually lived in Northern California, who helped us pass the law. And one of the things that she said that went into the record was, she said, I'm doing everything I can to extend my life, but no one has the right to prolong my death, which was a pretty powerful statement. <laughs> the sad thing was that Jennifer never had a, a chance to access medical aid in dying, uh, she was actually put on the palliative sedation, and she woke up while she was on the palliative sedation and had a horrible death. Uh, to this day, her husband is a strong advocate for expanding choice at end of life. So what is medical aid in dying? Everyone wants to know about that. Uh, medical aid in dying, and one of the things that we always want to talk about, and I'll get a little bit more to it, is that when we discuss end of life options as an organization, we always want people to know that we support all end-of-life options, you know, such as you know, hospice care, palliative care, uh, also including one of the things that people are not aware of is voluntary stop eating and drinking. That's something that is done in the country on a regular basis. But we also know that medical aid in dying is a proven practice that actually works in the country. And it's now part of the standard practice of end-of-life care in California. So Governor Brown signed medical aid and dying into law on October 5th. It went into effect on June 9th. And it was a powerful quote what the governor actually said. He said, I do not know what I would do if I were dying in a prolonged and excruciating pain, but I'm certain, however, that it would be a comfort to be able to consider the options afforded by this bill, and I would not want to deny the rights to others. Pretty powerful statement. So medical aid and dying. Uh, I always want to point this out. It's re referring to, some people use the term death with dignity. Uh, medical aid in dying is when someone is diagnosed with a prognosis of six months or less to live. They are mentally capable of making their own decisions. Uh, they can request for a prescription from their doctor to have access to medical aid in dying, but they have to have a prognosis of six months or less to live. What are some of the requirements? A person has to be 18 years older. You have to be a resident of California. Uh, the other part of it is that, you, which I already mentioned, you have to be capable of making your own decisions. Other requirements that it requires is that you have to have an attending physician who actually makes the prognosis, who brings in a consulting physician, who determines that you do have a terminal disease with a prognosis of six months or less to live. Uh, you have to have a witness to attest to that. Two witnesses, one person must be, one person could be a family member, the other person cannot be a family member. Uh, it also has to be a process of having two verbal requests followed by a written request. Uh, two verbal requests are 15 days apart, followed by a written request, which uh, follows right after the two verbal requests. And then prior to ingesting the medication, and also a person has to be able to self-ingest the medication on their own, so a family member can prepare the medication for an individual that has a terminal disease, but they cannot give it to the person to drink. A person has to be able to chew and swallow, in other terms, self-ingest the medication on their own. And 48 hours prior to a person uh, taking the medication, that individual has to fill out an attestation form that actually outlines that this is something that they chose to do, they're of sound mind, and so on and so forth.
So one of the things we always want people to know is that medical aid in dying is not assisted suicide. Uh, medical aid in dying is a legal definition when someone chooses to access medication to end their pain and suffering. So these are people who want to live, but there's no medications that can prolong and cure their terminal disease. Their terminal disease is killing them. So they want to end their pain and suffering. And we find that many people who actually access medical aid in dying, some people might not, never even take the prescription, but it provides a comfort knowing that they have medication in case there's an emergency, in case they are actually at a point in their life that the pain becomes so unbearable they have to uh, end their pain and suffering. So there's so much to the law that I can go over with you, but I wouldn't just have enough time to do that. But what I just want to say to you is that if I was standing here, and I'll leave you with this thought, if I was standing here talking to you about hospice, and this was 20 years ago, some people might have felt that was a difficult discussion. But now hospice is a part of the standard practice of end-of-life care. So medical aid in dying is now part of the standard practice of end-of-life care in California. And we've learned that from Oregon, which has been the law for over 20 years, the practice. So now that it's here in California, we already see a number of people who have already accessed the medication to end their suffering and pain. And we already anticipate in the first year alone, over 50,000 conversations are taking place with doctors and over 2,000 prescriptions will be written. Compared to Oregon, where it's been the law for over 19 years, 1,500 prescriptions are written. So our population is pretty huge. So there was so much more to cover, but I just want to let you know that I also left materials in the back so people could be more uh, you know, informed about your end of life options that are available. But just always, what I always tell people, you don't want to wait till you might get bad news about your terminal illness. Start having conversations with your doctor now about your end of life care because that's very important. You want to know if your doctor is supportive of your end-of-life care treatments. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much for having me.